Welcome back to the Kaiser Report. I'm Max Kaiser. Time now to go to Puerto Rico to talk to Mike Maloney, an author, a monetary historian, filmmaker, Beyond Hidden Secrets of Money. Chapter 7 is now out, and it's about money, velocity, deflation, hyperinflation. Mike, welcome back. Thanks for having me, Max. It's always great to be on your show. All right. Now, one of the biggest themes of our show during the 2007-2010 period of the financial crisis was the great inflation deflation debate. As central banks began bailing out banks and doing quantitative easing, most said there would be massive inflation. Instead, it's been deflation, something you talked about. Why? Well, uh the people that were all talking hyperinflation, hyperinflation, and, and back in 2009-10, uh, everybody was on that side of the boat, basically, the, the inflation, hyperinflation side, because they were seeing the base currency uh, massively increase. We did hyperinflate base currency, uh, and we're still hyperinflating base currency. But it's basically to stave off a collapse in the credit uh, based portion of the currency supply, which is the vast majority of it, the portion that the banks create through fractional reserve lending. And uh, what the people that were saying inflation really didn't understand was velocity, uh, because in the long term, prices are determined by the quantity of currency. But over the short, you know, so that's the long term. But in the short term, it's velocity that makes up this the rising and falling prices. We've seen asset prices inflate, but when it comes to retail inflation, we've actually been experiencing no inflation or deflation. Gasoline prices are way down from 2007. All right, so in other words, during the buildup before the crisis, you had a, an expansion both of money supply and credit. These two things are expanding quite uh, s substantially, driven primarily yeah. by the global energy market, because the energy market is very capital intensive, and around the world people are drilling for oil, and they borrow lots of money, and then there's driving GDP growth, which uh, drives more demand, and you have a lot of credit, and you have a lot of base money, as you call it, and then when the crisis hit, the response was, let's pump up that base money, but the credit started to shrink, it started to deflate, and it was deflating at a rate faster than they could pump. And so the net result was deflation. Uh, and, and we're still experiencing that. And this is something that all the pundits, including myself at the time, didn't really understand. A few like you and a couple of others chimed in and said, hey, hey wait a minute, this is more of a, uh, let's talk about velocity of money. And, and so where are we in this cycle? And I should also point out that a lot of your work does tie into cycles, wealth cycles. And so this is something you look at quite closely. So where are we in the cycle, Mike? Well, you know, the, the world uh, right now, there's real estate bubbles that are just at the beginning of popping in Canada, New Zealand, uh, Australia, China, and parts of Europe. And uh, that is a very deflationary thing. Uh, the United States is about to go into a recession. We're in the third longest economic expansion in the history of the United States. There's normally a recession every four and a half years, and we're over seven years into this expansion. Uh, it will very shortly become the second longest expansion if it continues. I believe we've already started a recession. Uh, you won't find, a recession is a trailing indicator, so you don't find out that you're in a recession until you've actually been in one for six months. Um, and these events, what, what I believe we're leading up to here is a deflationary implosion. And right now, we've got negative interest rates uh, in countries that represent a quarter of the world's GDP. They have negative interest rates. And uh, uh, we've got massive currency creation going on that is bigger than QE1, 2, or 3 when you add up the Bank of Japan and the ECB. They're both massively in inflating their currencies, their base currency supplies, the paper uh, units of currency that exist. Uh, okay, let's and, look at the uh, banking system for a second because you, the banking system runs on what's called fractional reserve banking system. So the bank yes. only has to keep a portion of uh, cash on hand. They lend out cash to another bank. That bank keeps a small portion on its books and lends out a bunch of other money and then the new banks end up putting a little bit on their books and they lend out a lot more money. And that cycle, that, that, that uh, path of money through the banking system is the velocity of money. When there's a lot of demand for money, 
a lot of loans are made, and the velocity, the speed at which this money is moving around, is increased. When the, when the demand falls during, let's say, a deflationary period, as we're describing here, um, the velocity comes to a standstill. But it's important to understand that- Right, and yeah. quantity can fall, too, as people pay down debt and stop borrowing. The, the quantity of currency can fall. Right, so people are paying down debt, and the uh, debt itself, these um, zombie, well, you know, all these banks have huge, um, on their balance sheets, portfolios of bond assets that they claim are worth 100 cents on the dollar, but there's no market for them. They really have zero cents on the dollar, and but every day they have to be rolled over. So the banks give them money to roll over this zombie portfolio of debt assets and securities, uh, but that money, of course, doesn't get lent out to consumers or business owners or to, for capital expense. It's all used to roll over this graveyard of debt assets because yeah. the bankers have a gun to the politician's head. And they say, if you force us to mark to market the real value of what we hold in our books, we're gonna crash the economy and, and they are holding the economy hostage. Uh, is that correct? Uh, you know, I, I don't have absolute proof of that, but yes, uh, the assets that the banks hold are only worth uh, what they can be sold for. And if all the banks tried to sell them at the same time, they're worth zero, as you say. And so in a crisis, you see these assets fall to where the uh, only entity that's willing to buy them at full price are the central banks. And when they buy them, they're creating uh, base currency that didn't exist. They write a uh, check on an account that has a zero balance and currency springs into existence. The, it, it's not just uh, uh, the concept isn't just corrupt, it's morally bankrupt. Right, so when the subprime disaster hit, the response from the central banks was to bail out the banks by printing lots of money. And, 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 and in the process, the mechanics of that involve swapping their dead assets on their books for fresh cash. That, that's, the, right. that's the window between central banks and the banks. Okay, here we are. Eight and years. those dead assets, as you say, were worth zero except to the central banks because the central banks have no cost of capital. When they buy something, uh, they just write a bogus check. Right, so now here we are eight years later, and the question is, these central banks whose balance sheets have ballooned 300%, 400%, 500% with all this worthless debt that they can't sell, the question that the IMF and the World Bank and the global banks are asking themselves is now how do we bail out the central banks? Because now the central banks need to be bailed out. So they're trying to perhaps with the IMF bail them out with a special drawing right, which is the currency of the IMF, uh, and create a $100 trillion global uh, uh, lending facility. Um, that's, that might happen, or what could most, what, but that, that, that could happen, Mike. They could, they could bail us out again by issuing $100 trillion with the special drawing rights, or what could be another scenario, Mike Maloney? Uh, well, the, the only other scenario that I can see is that uh, things start to collapse, that precious metals uh, start, uh, you know, the ascent on their way to infinity until, you know, every 30 to 40 years, the world has had a, a completely different monetary system. And we are way overdue for a new monetary system. We're about 44 years into this monetary system, 45 years. And... Uh, um, what happens is each monetary system, when it starts to break down, there's an emergency meeting somewhere of the world's finance ministers. There was the Genoa Conference in 1922, the Bretton Woods Conference in 1944, the Washington Accord, I think it was called, uh, or Smithsonian Agreement, I can't remember which one, in 1971. That one was a moot point because we had already gone on the global dollar standard. But this is actually the worst designed of all those monetary systems. And as, uh, you know, I'm on the side with Jim Rickards. Jim Rickards thinks that we're going to have monetary chaos, that it won't be an orderly transition because you can't get people. But there's going to be, history's gonna be, gonna repeat. There's going to be some emergency meeting of the G20 finance ministers and a whole bunch of economists to try and hash out a new world monetary system. But when you see the nails in the coffin of the death of the dollar standard, they are coming more and more rapidly. And, you know, we just had 
uh, the yuan added to the uh, basket of currencies that make up the SDR. And then, uh, you know, a month before that happened, uh, they started selling SDR bonds uh, that were, were payable in yuan in China. And uh, so these are massive nails in the coffin of the global dollar standard. All right, so, so, so let me let me just uh, direct our, our, the viewer's attention to, you know, the one chart that I think you are talking about vociferously these days that illustrates exactly where we are is this velocity money chart, which we're going to put up on the screen. And this, despite all the rhetoric about anemic growth, some growth, future growth, money supply growth, uh, all that, you just put all that aside. Because if you look at this one chart, it looks like somebody's dead. It's a dying thing. It's a dead, ugly thing. It's right. Yes. I mean, this is the key chart to look at, Mike. Well, it's a chart that proves that Keynesian economics doesn't work. Uh, they think that they can just lower the interest rate and, and uh, create a whole bunch of currency that didn't exist uh, before they, you know, before they waved their magic wand. Uh, and that that will stimulate things somehow. But if you can't get people to borrow it and spend it, and it just sits on the bank's balance sheets, the velocity is zero of that extra currency that they created. And so uh, it's the velocity is all determined by the public's mood. It is the psychology. I like to say things uh, that things are psychological or psychological. Uh, they're both. Uh, the economy is psychological in that it runs in waves and cycles, and those cycles are very logical based on the psychology of the public. And uh, if the public is feeling good, they borrow and spend, velocity is high. If the public gets scared, uh, they, they sit at home and watch TV and they don't go out to dinner and sign that credit card uh, receipt that, that creates currency. They don't take out an auto loan and create currency with their signature. They don't buy a house and create currency with their signature. Each time currency is created, that loan is created so that it can be spent. They, uh, a bank won't just normally uh, go up to Joe Sixpack and, and offer to loan him a whole bunch of currency unless the, uh, Joe Sixpack is purchasing something that the bank can put a lien against. That's when the currency is created is if it's going to be spent immediately. And that causes velocity to uh, go up and causes the economy to boom. Uh, All right, Mike, we we're going to have to cut her off there. It sounds like okay. uh, goldfish economics. Goldfish famously will eat themselves to death. Uh, well, anyway, Mike, we got to go. Thanks for being on the show. Thank you, Max. It was great being here. All right, that's going to do it for this episode of the Kaiser Report with me, Max Kaiser, and Stacey Herbert. I'd like to thank our guest, Mike Maloney of goldsilver.com. If you'd like to get in touch with us, tweet us at Kaiser Report. I'd just like to note that no goldfish were harmed during the filming of this episode. Until next time, bye, y'all.